Hey folks, today I've got the brand new Polar Ignite 3. Now this watch is, of course, as the name implies, the third generation Polar Ignite and is unquestionably the biggest jump upwards that we've had in all of this entire lineup. Uh, this unit here now has a brand new AMOLED display. You can see it's 1.28 inches, so just shy of 1.3 inches there, which is kind of one of the standard sizes, usually 1.2, 1.3 inches, uh, 416 by 416 pixels and 16 million colors. And to its credit, it looks really nice. The top glass is Gorilla Glass 3. It's got this like little bit of curvature on the side. It reminds me a bit of a Pixel Watch, but I think it's actually a little bit nicer, mainly because it's just a little bit bigger uh, from the actual internal display standpoint. Uh, as you can see there, it's not considered an always-on display, not all the time anyways, or at least not by default. You can turn it on, and that's what I have right now. So this is basically the clock face that when it's not in the always-on configuration. If you have it where it has no always-on at all, then it just simply turns to black. Uh, and then when I raise my wrist, this would turn back on. Uh, or you can just go and tap it, and it shows up there as well. Uh, as you can see, there's a little bit of lag, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Other new things here, as I just noted, is that always-on display option. It is an option to turn on. Uh, the battery life without it is claimed as five days, uh, and with it, I'm getting like a day and a half or so, including workout time. So uh, it's about the same as you find from like an Apple Watch or a Pixel Watch or Samsung Watch, something in that kind of range there. The next new thing is they said they've increased the processor by 2x, or basically doubled the processor, uh, and that may be the case, but again, we'll talk about it in a second. There's a lot of slowness here, so uh, if that's the case, then I'm glad they at least doubled it because it probably needs a bit of a tripling. Also on the new list is a really big one, which is the addition of multi-band GPS, also known as dual frequency GPS. This is the first time we've seen add that technology to any of their watches. So it is kind of interesting they're adding it to this watch here. But again, something we'll have to caveat later on in the GPS accuracy section. We most recently saw Coros add it to their Apex 2 uh, Pro, as well as their Atec as well as the Coros Vertex a year ago, and Garmin's added it on most of their watches this year uh, from certain price points anyways. Yesterday's Instinct Crossover didn't have it, but uh, cheaper 400, 255 did have it. So in any case, that's something that's becoming kind of a bit of a standard from like that $400 price point and up. So it's nice to see here on a $329 watch, which by the way is a price, $329 either euros or USD. The next new thing is the ability to customize these complications on the watch face. So for example, there's the battery, the weather, my heart rate. I can go and customize these to whatever I want on the different watch faces that there are. There is no watch face store, but there's a handful of watch faces you can choose from, uh, and I like the fact that I can put whatever data metrics I want in there. Okay, and a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting or useful, if you could just hit that like button at the bottom there, it really does help out this video and the channel quite a bit. Next, they've added the walking test and the running test. They previously had the fitness test there, uh, and these are basically ways to calculate your VO2 max. I tried out the walking test in the past on Polar's other watches and didn't find it super awesome, but the running test did a good job of pretty much nailing my VO2 max at the time. In theory, the nice part of the walking test is it doesn't hurt so much uh, because it's not like a pure VO2 max go until you die sort of thing, whereas the running test is sort of that, you know, basically run until you die kind of thing. Speaking of sports bits, they've added slap to lap here, so basically the ability to take manual laps by simply hitting the watch. Uh, it works pretty well, like you just simply hit it and boom, you get a lap. Uh, and that's because there's only one button on this watch. You see right there that one button uh, plus a touchscreen display. Uh, and, you know, a lot of watches this year have gone towards more buttons or adding buttons. Uh, we've seen that from pretty much every company actually, uh, whether it be Coros or Apple or uh, even, you know, Google with the, the Pixel Watch has two buttons on it plus a touchscreen. Uh, I suspect that I suspect it might have just been a bit too late in the year for Polar to change and jump on that wave. Uh, so they're using the slap to lap option to go ahead and get around that. Meanwhile, on the back, you will find that the Polar Precision Prime optical heart rate sensor. This is the same sensor that's been in a variety of other watches. And then before we talk about two future features, uh, two quick kind of like housekeeping things. One, the weight on this is only 35 grams. So very, very lightweight. It feels very lightweight. It has two strap sizes in the box, so this lower portion right there. I'm wearing a small right now. I've tried the large and medium, uh, and here's the thing. I appreciate them adding the two strap sizes in the box, but this is unquestionably the worst strap I have ever tried on on a watch in ever. It's horrible. It's painful, like literally painful to put on, and it's because they've used what is essentially like sandpaper material on this so it sticks on your wrist and it really legitimately hurts. And it's not just me that thinks this. My wife also had a bunch of choice words that I can't repeat on camera right here uh, when she did her workouts with this. Uh, it is really a bad, bad band. Uh, and thankfully they do have other bands that you can add to it and it is a standard 20 mil band so you can swap it out for wherever you want. But I don't know how this got past like the internal testing side of it because this is it's not good at all. Uh, otherwise, battery life, they claim 30 hours of, up, up to 30 hours of GPS battery life on this. That seems super optimistic for me given the battery burn that I'm seeing uh, during other GPS workouts, but 
I'll have to believe them on that. Uh, and they're saying five days in smartwatch mode. Uh, they don't make a claim for the always on mode. So in regular non always on mode, five days of battery life. Now then there are two other features coming later on this month that are not on the watch, unfortunately, today. The first one is something called Sleepwise. Uh, so Polar has long had sleep tracking on their watches, but this new basically app-driven kind of thing, showing it right here, some on the screen, uh, will show you basically sleep insights based on last night's sleep for the day ahead. So it can pretty much tell you when you need to drink a coffee during the day. I actually like this idea. It's gonna tell you kind of, you know what, the day's gonna look like based on how well your sleep went the night before. Cool concept. I will definitely give that a test and report back here in a video or something like that down the road once that's here, but uh, it's not here today. The second piece is voice training guidance. So if you have Bluetooth headphones in, uh, you can get a voice training guidance. So it sounds like basically splits and things like that as you're doing your workout. It does require your phone be with you though. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there is no speaker in this itself, no microphone in this. And then there's also not a beeper in this. So it's all vibration based alerts. Uh, now, as I said, we'll just do a quick walkthrough of the user interface right here. This is the watch face. I can swipe to the right uh, and I can get to, for example, the activity page. You can see my steps and then I can tap it. Uh, and and then it loads up. And sometimes this is like responsive. That was the most responsive I've ever seen it, by the way. So I guess you're like showing off for the camera a little watch. Uh, but a lot of times it's very, very laggy. Uh, so watch as I press this button to try to get back. One, two, there we go. Press it again. That one's not too bad. Uh, sometimes like swiping up to get notifications or clearing notifications can take a long time. I've swiped down. There you go. You just see that lag. Uh, there's a lot of things tend to be really slow. So to show you a couple other widgets really quickly here, I got the activity like I showed you. This is my training this week. So uh, again, the week just started on Monday. So you can see I got back my run there, my workouts from yesterday. Uh, swiping again, this is your sunrise and sunset time. So I like this little display, it looks nice. I can tap this to get more information about it. Um, I do find it funny that sometimes it has the wrong city. Uh, this city is like a kilometer and a half away from me. Uh, it seems to be a polar thing across all their watches for a long time, uh, but nonetheless, if I go and press the button, you can just see that lag to get back there. Swipe again, here is the weather. Also looks really pretty, uh, not the weather itself, that looks bad, but um, basically, you know, the actual UI, I like that and looks pretty nice. And I can do the same for other metrics as well. Here's my sleep charge, for example. Uh, you can see that there, my sleep time, my actual sleep, continuity, long interruptions, REM, etc. cetera. Uh, and all this information, of course, is available on the Polar Flow app also. You can see that on the screen right here. Uh, in terms of accuracy, it's a little bit behind when I actually went to sleep last night. Uh, this is probably about a half an hour or so behind. Uh, the wake up time is correct though, so that's good there. There's also the ability to control music. Uh, there is no music storage on this itself, uh, but you can control music on your phone. You can kind of change the volume, skip tracks, and all that goodness there. Uh, it works fairly well. Uh, now let's kind of swipe back into sort of going towards the sports features a little bit. Uh, and this is basically the daily suggested workouts or today's suggestion. And it comes in three categories. You've got strength, cardio, and supportive. Uh, and each day as you start out, it's gonna give you either a cardio or a strength workout to begin. And then on your second workout, if you basically finished your first workout, so I just got back from my run, uh, and now it basically says, hey, do a supportive workout instead to stretch out. Uh, and I can tap this and I can see a couple of options right there for that. Um, or it says you can still do another 30 minutes of cardio work if I want to. Seems valid since my run was pretty short. Uh, and then when you do one of these, so if I just go into mobility dynamic, uh, you'll get basically suggestions for this particular thing. So you can see each one of the components of the workout that you should do right there. Uh, and this is all part of Polar's FitSpark uh, feature. It's been around for a number of years and it's really, really cool. Note that it's not tied to a specific workout itself. So it says cardio. It's talking about like cardio in the general heart rate standpoint. It's not tied to saying go out and do eight by 800 meter running intervals. It just says instead, go do this amount of time in this zone uh, and basically focuses on that. It's a little bit different than what Garmin does, which is kind of the opposite, but Garmin's only focused on running and cycling versus this is more broad. It can basically kind of focus on any sport that you want it to. Now, speaking of those sports themselves, the way you access those, you can just press this button right here once and then tap on start training. This will bring a list of all the sports up. Uh, Polar has up to 150 sports in their database uh, and you can put a few dozen on this right there. You can see there's a heart rate icon and the GPS icon. Uh, in this case, it's not on my wrist, so that obviously it's not going to lock right away. If you do have a heart rate sensor, a Bluetooth sensor, you can wear that instead. Uh, and then I can go in here and add a structured workout if I want to. Uh, so under favorites, I can do that or training suggestions. Uh, you can see interval timer, countdown timer, and there's even back to start. Back to start though here is just simply giving you the direction towards your starting point. Uh, so you can see a photo right here from the middle of my run. There's a bunch of trees in the way of this. Uh, and so you have to kind of figure out your own way back there. Just saying, yo, your start location is that away. You figured out, but there is no core support on this or routing support. 
support or anything like that. You can go ahead and share your heart rate though, right there. So broadcasting or rebroadcasting a heart rate out if you want to. Useful like on a Peloton bike or Zwift or something like that. Any app that you wanna connect via Bluetooth uh, from a heart rate standpoint, you can do it and then use the optical sensor on this watch to go ahead and broadcast that out. Once you're ready to start your workout, just simply tap that red button right there in the middle uh, and then we'll start the workout. You'll then be able to see the data field that you configured uh, in the app itself on your watch there. And you can see a couple of these screenshots or sorry, photos from my run, uh, from yesterday's run, today's run, wherever they were uh, out, I was running along. And there's a couple different pages you can configure as well. For the most part, this is the same as Polar's existing watches. There's no real change there. What you won't find though is things like running power, for example, that's in their Polar Pacer Pro watch, uh, but it's not offered on this watch. It's too bad though, because that's actually a slightly cheaper watch. So I would have kind of hoped to see it on this. The same problem that Garmin has like in their Venue and Vivo Active lineups of like prettier watches, but not having the features of the lesser priced watches. Uh, uh, anyways, it's a, I don't understand why companies do that. Apple's figured that out. I'll give Apple credit there. Like this is the Apple Watch SE, 250 bucks. Has the same running features as the Apple Watch Series 8 at cost, you know, 150 bucks more. Uh, and even the same running features as something like the Apple Watch Ultra, which cost 800 bucks. So I think, you know, some of the legacy companies need to kind of figure that out a little bit. Uh, now, the question then becomes, is any of this data accurate? Uh, and that's a trickier question. Let's start with the easy bit, which is the heart rate side of it. Uh, and the answer to that is unequivocally yes. This is the best I've seen from Polar from an optical heart rate standpoint in, in quite a while. Uh, and you can see just some of these different charts right here, uh, whether it be an interval workout I did last night on the Peloton bike, spot on. This is a really hard, high intensity interval workout, you know, dropping uh, very quickly then back into recovery, but straight back up into very high heart rates and no problems at all. And then we got a run I did here where you can see I did basically intervals every one kilometer or so. Uh, no problem with these kind of spiked intervals, no issues there. And then my wife took it out last night as well uh, and did her run. Hers is just like a steady state build towards painful intensity, uh, but it tracked exactly with the heart rate strap there too. So then that gets into the multi-band or dual frequency GNSS or GPS on this watch here. Uh, now that is considered like the holy grail of GPS accuracy. It's designed to handle, even in Polar's own words, uh, tall buildings and you know complex scenarios and stuff like that. Unfortunately, that's simply not been my experience with this watch. It's actually been worse GPS accuracy than their non-multiband configurations and unquestionably the worst multiband configuration I've tested to date. Uh, and so it doesn't matter whether I'm in easy stuff or hard stuff. Let's look at this run I just got back from right here. Uh, you can see that even as I'm just going along on this like park trail, uh, it's offset on one direction on the outbound. I got to kind of right on the way back, but going through the woods here, again, these woods, like the trees or the leaves are mostly starting to come off the trees here. So it's not too bad. Uh, and it's just way offset. Uh, going along the rowing basin, these tracks should be identical. They should be on top of each other because it's the exact same path and I ran down the middle of the path on purpose and they're simply not on top of each other. It's the same with my wife's run last night in the neighborhood. This track should be directly on top of each other. She ran on the exact same spot on this uh, bike and running path and yet on the way out and the way back, they're not the same. And you know, one case she's off in the canal, another case uh, she's in the middle of the tram lines and not really where you typically would run. Then if I look at a run I did yesterday, a GPS kind of city test run, uh, starting off in like the easier areas, it was offset a lot of the times off in the buildings, just, you know, way in the middle of nowhere. And then once we got into the city, it was simply a proper dumpster fire. Uh, and it's tough because I get what Paul was going for here. They're trying to increase the accuracy. And in their media briefing call they had with like 80 plus people, they talked about how the conditions that lead to good accuracy in the GPS watch and said, you gotta have a good GPS chip set, you gotta have a good antenna design, and then it depends on the environment you're in. Uh, and then they kind of went on to like start to hint towards the fact that they put a good chip set in here, but for this particular watch design, uh, it was trickier. In particular, it was tricky for the antenna side of it. Uh, and I think we see that here. That's the same thing we look at other GPS watches and you can have the same GPS chipset like we see with uh, Coros and Garmin. They share that same chipset, but the antenna design is different and that's why we see better GPS result in the multiband configuration on Garmin than we do on Coros because of likely that antenna design. Unfortunately, this antenna design is not good. So where do we stand overall with this watch? Well, it's tricky. I think the display is beautiful. I like what they're doing there. Uh, it's laggy. Hopefully that's something they can go ahead and fix, you know, down the road and firmware updates or something like that. Uh, the heart rate is spot on, which is good. That's, you know, Polar's like bread and butter is heart rate driven things. And the features around like the FitSpark is good. And, and those components there around the structure workouts, if you want to pull them into the watch, all that's good stuff. All the sports stuff is good stuff. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the sleep wise looks like down the road. That all sounds exciting. Uh, the challenge though is the GPS accuracy is not good at all. And at this price point, 329 bucks, 
Apple Watch SE, if you have an iPhone at you know, 249, is better than this. Uh, battery life, uh, you know, they're different, right? So this has five days in a non always on configuration. This has roughly a day and a half, but you know, app wise, Apple obviously has tons of stuff uh, versus Polar has no app store. Inversely, uh, Polar has a bunch of those training and kind of, you know, sport fitness focused features that Apple doesn't really have unless you start downloading third party apps. And the same thing is true if you look at the Pixel Watch, if you're on Android, for example. Unfortunately, I'm relatively skeptical that we'll see Polar be able to fix the GPS accuracy issues in this because I suspect it really is intended design related, which is, of course, hardware. There are things they might be able to do to, to nudge that a little bit better, but uh, on the whole, it's, it's not good. And so that's going to be a bit of a drag on what otherwise would have been a really nice watch. Uh, hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. There's still yet more to come. With that, have a good one.